You're listening to The Complete Human Podcast, hosted by co-founders Jana Breslin and Evan DeMarco. We share authentic conversations about wellness, longevity, personal growth, and bio-optimization, along with inspiring stories that encourage community and social responsibility. We hope you enjoy this episode. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another edition of the Complete Human Podcast with your hosts, Jana Breslin and Evan DeMarco. Uh, so it's funny, one of our very first podcasts took place in at the Scripps Institute in La Jolla, California, mm-hmm. where we got to interview uh, Dr. Phil Bresnahan on the Smart Fin. And interestingly enough, we kind of seem to keep coming back full circle to the Scripps Institute. Um, our next guest is someone who spent some time there, but who has gone on to do some really incredible things uh, in ocean conservation, something that you and I are hyper passionate about. So I couldn't be more excited to introduce our next guest, but because I I like to let you introduce them, you sound so much better (laughs) when you do it. I'm going to have you do that, and then we'll have him talk a little bit more about himself. Amazing. Uh, Well, Dr. Enric Sala, thank you for being here with us today. I'm really excited to talk to you about everything that you've been up to. Um, I think your story is absolutely fascinating, going from academia to activism, and we are just really excited to chat with you today about that. So thank you for being here. Well, thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. Um, so we'd love to have you introduce yourself to our listeners and kind of give a little bit of a backstory on what you've been doing. Yes, I am a recovering academic. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I used to be a professor at Scripps Institution of Oceanography in the beautiful La Jolla, where I spent 10 wonderful years conducting research and teaching. And my research was about the impacts of humans in the ocean, impacts of fishing and global warming, how our overexploitation of the ocean, our warming of the ocean was uh, destroying marine life. And one day I realized that all I was doing was writing the obituary of the ocean. I felt like the doctor who's telling you how you're going to die, but not offering a cure. And as you can imagine, that was pretty <laughs> depressing. <laughs> so I decided- Yeah, it's heartbreaking. To, I, it, it was heartbreaking. It's still heartbreaking. It's difficult to be a conservationist these days and not be depressed. So I decided to quit my job, to quit my job as a professor and dedicate my entire life to the cure, to help bring back some of that richness and health of the ocean. So Dr. Sala, thank you for that. And and I think that brings up the question that we really want. You know, I, I think it's the question that leads into all of this is, is the ocean terminal or is there a cure? Can we bring it back from the precipice of, of death, basically, uh, or have we kind of, have we gone too far beyond uh, Is it too far gone? Yeah. Some things are too far gone, but we can bring back most of it. For example, the, the Caribbean used to have a, a seal, a monk seal, like the one in the Mediterranean or the Northwest Hawaiian Islands. The last individual of the Caribbean monk seal was seen in 1952. That species is gone. So this is something that we cannot bring back. Uh, the coral reefs are being killed all around the world because of ocean warming, because of climate change. Even if we achieve the goals of the Paris Climate Agreement, which means not exceeding two degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels of, of global temperature, still that means the death of 90% of the corals on our planet. So there are things that are going to suffer no matter what, But the good news is that most species are still there and the ocean has an incredible ability to bounce back. So we can recover much of it. And I can say that because I have seen it. That's fascinating. So so let's talk a little bit about the coral, right? Because if we say 90% of it is gone, doesn't the coral reefs throughout the entire ocean really offer the the base habitat for the rest of kind of the ecosystem within the ocean? And if we lose 90% of that, is there a cascading effect that ultimately starts to wipe out a lot of the, you know, the the marine life that we kind of, you know, that we're going to talk about? Coral reefs are like the rainforests of the sea. They have the largest number of species in the ocean. But, you know, the coral reefs in Indonesia, if we lose them, that's not going to affect directly the kelp forest of California, right? The, the species that live in the kelp forest here are not going to be directly affected by the loss of a coral reef in, in Indonesia or, or the Philippines. However, everything on our planet is connected and the destruction of the coral reefs is just one more straw on that uh, camel's back, right? Um, and 
we would lose not only the places with the richest richness, uh, the, the highest uh, number of species on the, on, in the ocean, but also these places are, the coral reefs are, when they are living and they grow, they are able to stop the destructive power of storms up to 75%. So they protect the coastal communities that live on the shores, but ocean warming and overfishing and pollution are killing the corals, which means that the coral reef is not growing, is not able to keep up with sea level rise, which means that that protective wall is going to lose its, its power, which means that with the increased weather events, there, there's going to be more uh, stronger uh, waves and the coral reef is not going to be able to provide that, that uh, shelter. So, you know, you, if the corals die, it's not just the species that live in the coral that will be affected. It's going to be the human communities living in the shore. So perhaps a real estate tip from you is don't buy in Miami right now? <laughs> if, I was a, if I were an insurance company, I would not insure anybody on, my, on Miami. <laughs> I mean, these places are, are, are going to be gone. They are, are, they are already suffering from floods on sunny days. Right. So, I mean, let's let's talk a little bit about kind of uh, you know the, the coral, and then as that pertains to ocean, you know, uh, you know, ocean protection. But I think for the first time we saw two hurricanes headed towards land. Um, you know, obviously that seems to be indicative of ocean warming, of of climate change. So, how is it that we as a species, and you talk a lot about conservation, how is it that we as a species can really start to impact change that might have an impact or, or might affect positively the, you know, the ocean environment over the next couple of years. Yeah. You know, there is a saying that says that, that the wise man is the one who plants an oak tree, knowing that he will not enjoy its shade. Right. Um, we are, we humans are very good at first discounting the future, right? Everything is, has to be short term. And especially now we, everybody wants immediate uh, satisfaction and doing something now that I have been told it, it might be a sacrifice for something that I will enjoy in the future. Now I'm not going to do that. That's a huge problem we have. And, and economists and behavioral scientists are very aware of this. The problem is that, you know, it's a in, ingrained part of, of human nature. And there are things you know, it, to fix the problems of climate change. We need to do big, big things. We need to shift to renewable energies. We need to go carbon neutral by 2050. That means that the changes in our society, the way we move, the, the way we use energy, are going to be huge. And that means huge investments by governments, serious regulation, and serious transformation of entire industries. And of course, you know, we, well, that means a, a lot of change, a lot of effort, and uh, it's, it's very difficult for us to do, to do the right things. But we have no option. We have no other option. And I think that this pandemic has shown us very clearly that we cannot pretend that we live in a bubble and can be just fine. And that we're immune. What, in, yeah. in the, exactly. And, and, you know, it only took one person to get infected by that virus in China to stop the entire world you know that is what happens in china doesn't stay in china uh, you know if you tamper with nature in one side of the planet the consequences are going to be global so we are all in this together and we cannot not act right now we cannot afford it so how do you you know as a conservationist go about trying to work with politicians to get that because politicians are very immediate gratification. I've got to deal with my constituents. My constituents need to see immediate results. They need to see benefits in their lives. So how do we, and you more importantly, as, as a conservationist, really you know, get politicians on board with this, the idea that we have to plant the oak tree today, knowing that we might not ever get to sit in its shade? Yeah, this is a, a very tricky issue because the political cycles are much shorter than ecological cycles, right? <laughs> it takes decades for a forest to come back, but most politicians only have a, a shelf life of four years, right? Uh, but what has been very effective for us is to use a combination of the emotional argument and the rational arguments. So if we have taken 
with our pristine seas project, the National Geographic. You know, our goal is to inspire leaders to create big national parks in the ocean, in key parts of the ocean. We take leaders with us to the field when we can. And if they cannot come, we bring the places to them with, through our films. And invariably, these people fall in love with these wonderful places. It's difficult to be in a beautiful natural place and not fall in love with it. And once they understand that these places are unique and irreplaceable and that we need to preserve them, then we come with the rational arguments. We come with scientific evidence that shows why these places are important, but also the economic arguments that shows that the economic output of a place that is environmentally healthy is greater than a place that is being continuously degraded. And it is this combination because one alone is not going to make it. You can have all the scientific or economic reports, but if you don't have that political will that you can only get through that emotional connection, you know, and the, these studies are not going to be sufficient. So it is that combination of the heart, the pocket and the mind that uh, I think is, is the most successful. So I, I want to touch upon that because we watched your TED talk, which I thought was brilliant. And it was fascinating to look at the economics of fishing, the commercial fishing, uh, you know, business and recognize that only a tiny percentage of it is legitimately profitable when you take away like the government stipends and some of the, the subsidies. So could you tell us a little bit more about that and, and kind of what you guys are doing to, to shine a light on how bad that fishing industry is and how unprofitable it is? Yes. So to give some, some context, we reached peak fish 25 years ago, which means that the global fishing catch of wild fish caught in the ocean reached its maximum in the mid-19s, and it's been declining since. 80% of the fish stocks, the species of fish that people catch and consume com commercially, 80% of them are overfished, meaning that we are taking them out of the water faster and they can reproduce. So we're talking about you know, the law of diminishing returns. 90% of the large fish in the ocean, the sharks, groupers, cod, tuna, are gone. We lost them in the last 100 years ago, in the last 100 years alone because of, of too much fishing. So the problem is serious, right? Um, aquaculture, farm fish is, is increasing, which is going to replace some of the lost fish. But... Uh, we cannot continue with that fishing effort because we are just depleting the ocean more and more and more. Now, what do countries do? Some countries are trying to improve the research. Uh, some countries have quotas, which limits the amount of fish that can be caught. Some countries create no-take areas to allow the fish to recover and help to replenish the areas around. But most countries, they subsidize their fishing fleets to continue with the over-exploitation. So every year, $20 billion are used by governments, and this is taxpayers' money, this is your money and my money, that is used by governments to subsidize, to prop up the fishing activities that are destructive, that continue, that perpetuate the overfishing. And that doesn't make any sense. And when you think, you mentioned before the, the profitability, the high seas, the waters beyond national jurisdiction, now half of the fishing in the high seas would not be profitable without government subsidies. So economically, it doesn't make any sense. At the risk of sounding like Zac Efron, wow. <laughs> uh, so, so here's a question. Right? Is the what is the problem then? I, I guess like that's that's a fascinating stat, um, and, and the numbers there are very alarming. But is the problem the fishing? Is the problem overpopulation? You know, how do you take a step back and from a macro level, from a three hundred and you know a thirty five thousand foot view, start to address the underlying problems? Because the subsidies are clearly an issue. But if we're fishing to feed people, are there simply too many people on the planet to feed? Or is there a viable way to fish without destroying, uh, you know, without making some of these fish species extinct? Or, you know, as you talk about a lot in the TED Talk, is, is really violating the pristine waters of the high seas? Yeah, so first, the world already produces enough food for 10 billion people. Only that we waste a third of it from the so farm sad. to the table. 
from the, uh, isn't it sad? You know, we waste a third of the food that the world produces. In the United States, it happens mostly at the table or in the fridge. You know, it's over um, purchasing, over consumption. In developing countries, it's, uh, it happens at the farm level. It's, it, it, that food is, is lost, it's wasted because there are not enough, uh, you know, the, the markets, the supply chains are not strong enough. The markets are too far away, they don't have refrigeration, right? Same f- with many fish in, in developing countries. So we don't need to put more effort in fishing. We don't need to cut more forests or to overgraze more grasslands to produce the food we need. That's, that's uh, something that should be, should be clear. Second, the population numbers are a problem, but it is the per capita input, the per capita consumption that is uh, the issue here. If we had 10 billion people eating like the average Chinese, you know, the, the footprint would be much lower than if we had 10 million people with the, with the consumption of, of an American, right? So it is a balance between population and, and the, the footprint, the energy use and, and the consumption of resources by, by every person, which is tricky. Um, but we know what we need to do. There are basically three things we need to do. One is to face off fossil fuels and shift to a renewable energy economy and go carbon neutral by 2050. That would help to mitigate the impacts of global warming, which is the, the worst thing that is happening to us. Two, we need to change the way we produce food. So we need to shift from this agriculture, industrial agriculture, which is based on monocultures like soy or corn that takes up so much land, so much fertilizer and pesticides and all this, this poisonous chemicals and three quarters of the fresh water we use. And we need to shift to a regenerative agriculture that instead of wasting the soil away, helps to continue producing soil, which in turn absorbs a huge amount of uh, our carbon pollution from the atmosphere, which also helps with, with climate change. And that would help to produce food that is not only sustainable, but also uh, healthier. And, the third, and also in the ocean, we need to fish less and create more areas that are no take areas, marine reserves, where the fish can recover and reproduce much more and help to replenish the areas around. Right? And the third thing, which is related to this last one, is that we need more, to give more space to nature. Today, only 7% of the ocean is in protected areas and only 15% of the land is in national parks or nature reserves. And, and the science is telling us that we need at least 30% of the planet protected by 2030. If we are to avoid an, the extinction of 1 million species and the collapse of our life support system. So let's say there aren't any changes that we make as, as humans. What, ha- like, what does the world look like in 100 years? You wouldn't like it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have a feeling. I'm getting the hint there. Yeah, absolutely. Well, look, look at this. No. If let's let's take today as a baseline, right? The Amazon is burning more than ever and releasing all this carbon that is in the uh, in the trees and, and in the soil, and that contributes to making the atmosphere still warmer, which is helping to produce these crazy extreme weather events, like the raging wildfires in California. Now every summer, there are the and you you all too are close to these these uh, fires this summer. Every summer now, wildfires are going to become a staple of, of California, right? This is an accept. This is unacceptable. Oh, hurricanes! This is going to be probably the, the strongest hurricane season in, in in a long time. You you mentioned even uh, two hurricanes uh, coming together in the Gulf of Mexico. We have the wildfires in Australia. We have floods. We have droughts, and we have the collapse of many species of of fish. I mean. It's already bad. I mean, if it gets worse, if we don't do anything, it's going to get much worse, which is going to affect not only uh, all the other species, but it's going to affect human well-being. And again, I think that this pandemic is the loudest wake-up call we've had. The pandemic was caused by our broken relationship with nature. In this case, was wildlife trade, people getting in in contact with wild animals. But before it was SARS, MERS, uh, Zika, 
HIV, Ebola, all these infectious diseases that come from animals come from our trading animals, wild animals like commodities all around the world or by destroying their habitats like the forest where they live and getting in touch with uh, these viruses that our immune systems are not familiar with. So it's not separate crisis, climate, nature, uh, the health crisis right now. It's all, it's one and the same. And the very root of this crisis is our disrespect for our life support system, the, our broken relationship with nature. And we have no option. You know, we have no alternative. If we want to continue living in a planet where it's going to be um, a comfortable place to live. It kind of seems like the planet is just smacking us, you know, tapping us on the head and saying, hey, guys, wake up. Mm -hmm. um, are we are we listening? I think one of the things that was really fascinating out of the COVID thing is, is um, like India, some, Mumbai was saying that it had some of the cleanest air in history or in recorded history, same things with like China. But coincidentally enough, we've gone back to as a result of COVID and our you know, inability to kind of go out and go shopping, just single use plastics has gone through the roof. And so now there seems to be this demonstrable increase in single use mm -hmm. plastics entering the ocean. So how do we, how do we, you know, invite our listeners who I know are passionate about the oceans to recognize that COVID is a wake up call that if we don't do something, uh, you know, it's going to be triple hurricanes next year, you know, you won't be able to breathe in Northern California because of the fires, uh, you know, all of these things, what steps can we take on a, on a macro level or on a micro level that hopefully have a more macro impact? And, and I think these are the, the, like, what are the top three things that you would tell our listeners go out and do this today? Okay. Two things. One at the macro level and one at the micro level, macro level this year, everybody has to vote in November. If you want to live in a place where your kids are not going to get sick just because they are playing outside, where the rivers are not full of poison, where you consume in the ocean without uh, getting a rush. You have to vote for the candidate in this presidential election that shares your environmental values. Right? And that's all I'm going to say. I'm not going to be more, pres I'm well, I'm not going to be more prescriptive than that, but this is a key election. That also will depend whether the United States is going to lead the world on climate change by not leaving the Paris Climate Agreement. So that's something that everybody has to do, it's everyone's responsibility. Everyone and just for context, Dr. Sala, um, the current administration did back out of the current Paris Accords, correct? The intention, but there is a, in, these international agreements have a, have a provision that says that the, from the moment you announce you want to leave, then you have, you have to wait uh, four years to, to, to officially leave. So the United States is still part of the Paris Climate Agreement. And it is this, at the end of this year, where the United States, or, or early next year, where the United States um, could actually implement that, that uh, intention. But the United States is still officially within the Paris Climate Agreement. Sure. Thank you, sir. I, I just wanted to, to make that very clear for- Yeah, no, but, you know, but, but regardless, even if we are still technically within it, um, the Trump administration has been, um, you know, rolling back most of the environmental protections that uh, we, we en enjoyed, right? Um, so the second thing that people can do, and this is something that everybody can do every day, which is good for our health and for the health of the planet, which is eat more plants and less animals. <laughs> if we ate more plants, you know, we don't need to eat as much meat as, I I'm, I'm vegetarian, but most people in the, in the United States, especially, they eat too much meat. We can get all of the proteins we need and all the nutrients we need from plants. Uh, you know, bull, I want to be strong as a bull. Well, bulls eat grass, actually. You know, they get all, all, <laughs> all that protein, all the protein that they get, they get from plants, right? So it is easier for our bodies to get the proteins we need from, from plants. Also, uh, Livestock requires so much land. Do you know that in the United States, 41% of the land is used to raise livestock? Wow. 41% of the land. That's enormous. Right? So if we had a plant-based diet where you can still eat some meat, but not uh, daily, 
we would require much less land to produce the food we need, which means that we could give some of this land back to nature to, to restore natural ecosystems that would provide many more benefits to people like oxygen, carbon sequestration, uh, flood protection, retention of rainwater, filtration, natural filtration of clean water that, uh, that we can drink, and also less fresh water use. We could have m much more fresh water available to many, many more uses. And finally, livestock is one of the largest contributors to climate change because of all the methane, mostly from burping, right? And methane is a gas that is, has 25 times the greenhouse power as uh, carbon dioxide, the CO2. So uh, that would have benefits on our health, on nature, and also for climate change. So eat more, eat more plants and less animals. So that brings up a really fascinating conversation about monocropping. So that seems to be one of the biggest uh, environmental disasters right now is looking at monocropping, how you know, we're sucking all the nutrients out of the soil. We're not replenishing the value of that soil. So how does someone who goes and takes your advice and eats more plants, how do they ensure that they're not getting their food from a monocropped farm that is probably using more pesticides? Even organic can still be monocropped. So is, is there a solution in place in your mind that can help uh, you know, really deal with that element of our agricultural supply chain. Yeah, today organic is still uh, less than one percent of the U.S. market, so it's it's uh, it's still small, and that's a that's a big issue. The the traceability, right? It is difficult to know where our food comes from. And today, you know, there are projects that are labeled as organic, but there are many others that are self-labeled natural. That doesn't mean anything, right? So. Uh, <laughs> So what I do, what I do, and, and COVID has actually forced me to do that, and I am really enjoying it, is I go to the farmer's market here in my neighborhood in Washington, D.C. once a week to support the local farmers in, in Virginia, uh, the farmers nearby. The, these guys are the small farms. It's mostly organic products. Even the meat they have is pasture, small scale, right? And these guys couldn't, you know, it's very difficult for, for the small farmers to compete with the big farms that, that are owned by these big conglomerates, which in turn receive most of the government subsidies. So there is this, this uh, agricultural lobby that controls most of the agriculture. But I think now is the time that we cannot move as much as before. Now is the time to go local. local. And it, what I would encourage people to, to buy local and to go to the local farmer's market and support these hardworking people who are, you know, they are doing the right thing because that's what they have always done, what their families have done. And, and they believe in healthier food, uh, also uh, a, a healthier planet. So it's funny that you say that we had this conversation the other day and, and I had this idea that the single worst invention of all time was the refrigerator. <laughs> why, why, why do you think that? Well, you know, before the refrigerator, you had to walk to get your food probably at like a local, a local market. So you were, we were more active. Um, we had to farm and hunt and fish fresh. So there wasn't the supply chain or this value chain optimization where we're using Freon gas to keep things cold. Uh, we weren't buying in bulk. We weren't buying things that could survive longer. And then, you know, thus, you know, putting more chemicals into our body. Um, you know, just the, the packaging, the, the, the metals, the plastics, all of that. So I, I think, you know, just the refrigerator alone put us in a position where we could be more lazy about our food consumption and less aware of where that food was coming from, which meant that, yeah, Dole could go, you know, build a farm in the middle of nowhere and, you know, monocrop it to death. And so we would have all of this produce, you know, or all of this food at our house, whereas if we were small independent or small communities, we'd go to the local market. We would interact with people. We would have kind of that blue zone mentality where, uh, so, so that, was, that was my contention. I, I still think that if we actually, if everybody went away from the refrigerator for 12 months, it would, we would see a significant uh, impact in the, in, in the environment. Wow, 12 months. Yeah. Actually, you could write a book. I bet it would be a bestseller. <laughs> no, a year without my fridge oh, that'd be interesting yeah we'll call it ditch the fridge <laughs> <laughs> you know but you're right that technology has 
made us a little lazy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, ha it has. And, and I, I kind of come back to the single use plastics. I, I, I mean, we eat Uber eats, you know, five nights a week, and, you know, and I think we did it under the pretense of supporting local businesses, but with people being afraid to go out now as a result of COVID, there's this, you know, home delivery basis. And so, you know, we're really losing insights into the supply chain of our food. You know, where's the restaurant getting the food where, you know, how are they preparing it? How is it getting to us? Um, it, and obviously there's, uh, there's the need in some of, in some capacity because of COVID, but also I think it's really removed us from the intimate nature of how we get our food and how we, you know, how we consume that. Yeah. You, you mentioned before, that because of the pandemic uh, in many cities, like in India, they have had clear skies that they hadn't seen in, in decades, right? Something else is that has happened is all these animals coming back or, or coming closer to cities, right? Or humpback whales closer to shore. And I think that the, the biggest lesson that uh, nature is sending us in this pandemic is look at what I can do look how fast I can come back if you just give me some space. I think that that's, uh, you said that nature is kind of, uh, kind of biting back at us for what we have done to it. But I think that there is a positive message here that if we just give nature some more space, wow, look at how fast she can bounce back and continue providing for us. What would you say are the greatest pollutants that we have in our oceans and on land? Well, we have pollutants that we can see and pollutants we cannot see. No. Plastic today is, of course, the most conspicuous one. But when you think about plastic in the ocean, most of the plastic that you see on the surface, you know, this is just 10% of the plastic in the ocean. Most of the plastic in the ocean is underwater, as deep as the deepest part of the ocean, and in microscopic form, what it's called microplastics, which comes from washing our synthetic clothes or larger pieces of plastic that have been breaking down by the power of the waves and the sand. So we, cannot, we can see only literally the surface, right? And most of the plastic is underwater. And we have, it's not that we have islands of plastic. It's, we have turned the ocean into a plastic soup. On the land now, it's scary. And I wouldn't like to spend the whole microplastics are in the air, not just in the water of the ocean. Um, but there are all these substances that people don't see, like mercury, for example, that is produced mainly by coal power plants. And much of the mercury ends up in the ocean, which is absorbed by little plants and then animals and up the food chain. And the larger animals ab absorb, accumulate more, more mercury. So coal power plants on the land are actually making the tuna in the ocean uh, more toxic because of all the mercury that it carries. So everything is connected. Right. I think a lot of people don't, they're not really making the connection or, or I feel like a lot of people don't really make the changes necessary because they think that they're not directly affected. They're like, oh, well, you know, I just threw this fork in the trash can. You know, it's not ending up in my backyard. Right. But they don't necessarily understand that it does go down the food chain. And if you're eating fish, you're consuming these microplastics, these toxins. And that's where it kind of really hits home for me too, is like, you know, obviously we talk a lot about health and everything, and mm -hmm. this is not just health of our ecosystem and our planet, but we do, we eat these things too. We're poisoning ourselves, if you want to say that. Well, and, and let's look at cancer rates, right? I th I th the exponential increase in cancer rates has to be indicative of what we've done to the planet and people just don't connect the dots right now. Um, I, I want to go back to microplastics. Um, so they're in the ocean. Has there been any research done on, you know, what happens to those over an extended period of time? You said a plastic soup, but will they eventually settle at the bottom? Is there a way to actually clean the oceans? Does the ocean have its own cleansing mechanism that will eventually get rid of these? You know, what, what's the silver lining in all of this for, for microplastics in the oceans? Yeah. We cannot clean all that plastic in the ocean. It's impossible because <laughs> on our expeditions, you know, we have done expeditions to the most remote places in the ocean, to the Arctic, to the Southern Ocean, to Antarctica, to places in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. And we have collected water samples everywhere we go. You know, one liter water samples, that's a quarter of a, of a gallon. And in 80% of the samples, no matter how far away we are from cities and people, 80% of the samples that we have collected contain microplastics. 
So they are everywhere. And we would have to filter the entire volume of the ocean to be able to clean it from microplastics. So that's impossible. What we need to do is to stop, to prevent plastic from more plastic from going into the ocean. And that requires industry from, you know, industry has to develop substitutes to plastic that are compostable. And there are already compostable plastic bags and other plastic items that are just fantastic. You can actually use it for your garden once you're done with it. Uh, we should also have governments regulate. In many places, governments have banned plastic bags. And, you know, nobody has died. No industry has collapsed. People are just using more durable bags and, and you know, single-use plastic bags are a thing of the past. You know, nobody, nobody misses them. Uh, so there are things that, that can be done. Um, but, you know, we, we cannot blame the, con the citizen, the consumer, because the industries are very good at saying, well, you know, we are not responsible. We just produce stuff because there is public demand, right? But also Steve Jobs said, well, the public doesn't know what, what they will want in the future. They, you know, they, they don't know that they are going to need a pod, uh, po, um, you know, an iPhone you know, or an iPod. So you know, that's a disingenuous argument by, by industry. Right? Uh, so everybody has a part, but industry cannot continue putting all the burden on, on us, on, on the citizen. Well, that's a great point. And I think here in California, a couple of years ago, when they banned, uh, banned plastic bags, there was an uproar. People were upset about it. And then three months later, nobody cared. You get used to it. It's just yeah. the new norm. And it's just, it's just funny how reactive we've become as a society. And I think probably more here in the U.S. than other places. But like, oh, my God, you're not going to take away my, my plastic bags. That's, you know, my, my constitutional right. It's like, is it really like, you know, bring your own bag to the grocery store. It's not that big of a deal. Yeah, you see all these paintings of Thomas Jefferson carrying his plastic bags, right? Yeah. Mm. When it, the constitutional rights, come on. Um, you know, people also were upset when smoking in public places were prohibited or when we, everybody had to wear seatbelts. And now you don't even think about it. That so is, okay, that's actually a really interesting one. And I've thought a lot about that. Which Completely one? Completely side topic, but seatbelts. That's one I can't figure out, right? Because that... Does smoking, I get it. Plastic bags, I get it. How does seatbelts impact anybody else other than the person who decides they don't want to wear a seatbelt and then goes through the windshield? I mean, you're, a, you're an idiot if you don't wear one. <laughs> but I've always questioned whether or not that was just a revenue generator for a state or a municipality versus anything uh, like, I don't know. If you guys have any thoughts on that one, please you know send us a message uh, afterwards. I mean, maybe been... they just want people to survive. <laughs> I, I get it, but sorry, I, I get it. I, it's just, what is the issue if someone doesn't wear it? Why is that against the law? Yeah, that's a good question. I don't know. Sorry, <laughs> sorry, doctors. I, that, that's you brought that up, and my brain went somewhere else. First. We talked about voting. That's an important one. We talked about you know really limiting single-use plastics. Um, what else can people really do to make sure that our kids or our grandkids are not, you know, living in a bubble because they can't breathe the outside air? Well, that are first, um, educate themselves, right? Um, people need to know more. And the problem today is that we have so many different media. It's impossible, right? Um, it's, it's so much information out there, but I would, um, suggest that people uh, purchase my new book, The Nature of Nature. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, I've, read, I've written this book, The Nature of Nature, Why We Need the Wild, where I um, ex tell stories about how different species of plants and animals and microbes interact to create these wonderful ecosystems that we call forests, wetlands, coral reefs, kelp forests, grasslands, that we enjoy. You know, they, this species and ecosystems provide everything that we need to survive. Oxygen we breathe, the food we eat, the clean water we drink, yet we take them for granted. So I wanted to share 30 years of research and much of what I have learned about how nature works in its complexity. You know, we humans are not able to recreate even the simplest ecosystem to keep us three alive, right? We spend billions of dollars every year to ship things to the International Space Station to keep four humans alive there. Right? Now, a human colony in Mars, you know, forget it, at least now. 
right? We don't, we don't have the ability to recreate what nature has been doing for billions of years for free, right? <laughs> so, so that's what I wanted to make sure that people understand the basic principles of ecology to realize that life on earth is a miracle. You don't need to be religious to believe in this miracle because it's absolutely, it's the most extraordinary thing in the universe. And, but I also wanted to uh, make sure that people understand that economically, it makes so much more sense to protect more of nature than to continue degrading it. And mm -hmm. the economic case is, is very clear. And just give you an example in the, in the United States, for every dollar that the government invests in our national parks, that dollar produces $10 in economic output that go to private hands. Ten dollars out of one. That's a pretty good return, right? So that's, that's the best um, return the government's ever had. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, another reason why we should uh, make sure that our national parks are well managed and we should make sure that we have much, much more. And actually science is the science is telling us that we need at least thirty percent of our land and ocean protected by twenty thirty. So I think that education and awareness is, is uh, the first thing to do. And then, you know, voting is one thing that will determine what happens in the next four years and probably longer time. But there are things that people can do locally. You know, we don't need to just to preserve the last wild places out there. There are things we can do in our cities. You know, now cities are thinking about planting more trees because global warming is making summers unsufferable. But we do know, you know, here in Washington DC, for example, you look at a map of the temperature in the city and you look at downtown, which is mostly concrete. It's red. It's so hot. And no, you could not, you didn't see anybody on the streets at, at midday in, in July and August in DC, but you go to Rock Creek park, which is this patch of forest that has been protected. And the temperature is five degrees Celsius lower. You know, wow, that's a place where I can live. So now cities are uh, greening themselves. You know, and, and this is something that citizens can do. You know, there is a uh, group here in Washington, D.C. that uh, the, their goal is to plant um, m many more thousands of trees uh, you know, across the city. So this is something that you can do on your own neighborhood. You, know, you can use an empty lot to have a vegetable gardens for, for, your, for your block, which is actually something that comes very handy during COVID, right? You mentioned about the fear of going out and, and, eat, and eating at the, at the restaurant. So everybody can do so many things at, from the micro scale to, to, the, to the national level. I think it boils down to the, the one thing that we've kind of forgotten, which is it all begins with caring. I think we've kind of forgotten that. Exactly. It's, it's this, it, people have become so survivalist as a result of, of this. And, and so as a result, we've, got, we've kind of forgotten the future. We've forgotten how to care about ourselves, our neighbors, our, our planet, the whole ecosystem. So I think it all kind of comes back to we're going to come out of COVID and how well we come out of it, uh, you know, dictates the success in the future. And if we just fall back into the same patterns that cause all the same issues, then what have we learned? So, mm -hmm. so these are the opportunities that I think really get us excited is to talk to people like you who are like, okay, yeah, you know, nature's beating us over the head. She's showing us the beauty of, of you know, what, what our planet can be again. Let's pay attention to the signs and do something mm -hmm. about it. Yeah. I hope you recorded that. That was beautifully put. <laughs> <laughs> I, I hope so too, because if I didn't, that means we got to start this whole interview over again. <laughs> Very true. Dr. So we're obviously going to drive people to the book. Um, you know, with the work you're doing with National Geographic, what does the next couple of years look like for you? What are you guys really focused on? How do people follow your journey? Yes, we have been working on a project called Pristine for the last 12 years. And you can go to pristincis.org, pristincis.org to learn more about it. Our goal has been to work with communities and country leaders to protect the last wild places in the ocean. We have been to 30 places from the Arctic to Antarctica through the tropics and have been able to help to protect 22 of them in marine reserves, in national parks in the ocean. And when you put them all together, that's more than half the size of the United States or about twice the size of India that is now fully protected in the ocean. It's been great, but clearly it's not enough because that uh, portion of the ocean that is fully protected from fishing and other damaging activities is less than 3% of the ocean. 
and we need 30%. So there's much more to do. So our goal of our project, Pristine is to double our impact, to double the area of the ocean that is fully protected in the next 10 years and contribute to that larger goal of, of 30%. And to do that, we use a combination of expeditions, scientific and economic research, films and other media, you know, the things that National Traffic is, is known for, uh, with the hope to, ins to work with communities and inspire governments to protect these places before it's too late. Wonderful. Um, I did want to, there was a question that I really meant to ask you and I was excited about and I forgot. So it's a little bit of a, a step back, but I was, I loved in your TED talk talking about, you know, really focusing on fishing in the areas, you know, outside of the high seas, you know, really designating these fishing areas. So my question is in the research that you guys have done, is there any theory that if you start fishing in those very specific areas that those fish will migrate to other areas and then that will force us to, to fish the high seas. And I, and I think about the Monterey Bay Aquarium, a, you know, here in Northern California, and that was a really heavy sardine and anchovy fishing ground. Mm -hmm. It became overfished and so they all migrated like to Peru and Chile. Is there any research that would dictate with what you guys have seen that if we kind of protect a lot of these oceans and force fishing to very specific areas that we would ultimately cause fish migration, which would have to open up the high seas again anyway? So the, the only reason we are fishing in the high seas is because we have overexploited the near shore waters. You know, if there were still lots of fish near shore, who would spend more fuel mm -hmm. to go farther, right? So because of the overexploitation, the depletion of the species that, of the fish near the coast, the fishing industry has had to go farther offshore and deeper. And right now, over 60% of the ocean is uh, targeted by industrial fishing. So there are very few places that are not fished. Most of the productive areas in, on the planet are, are being fished at, at this point. So what we need to do is to reduce the fishing effort. There is too much fishing effort. The World Bank suggested that if we cut the fishing effort by 40%, that would give us um, you know, economic, uh, the maximum economic uh, profits, which means that basically if half of the boats that, that we have in the water now were taken out of the water, the remaining half would be catching the same amount of fish that we are catching today, which just tells you you know, the overcapacity in the fishing fleet. You know, there are too many boats. They are propped up by all these government subsidies. You know, on land, nobody would tolerate that. Economically, it's the most inefficient thing. And it doesn't make any sense, right? So we need to eliminate these harmful subsidies. We need to cut the fishing effort. We need to create many more marine reserves to let the fish recover in some places so they can help replace the rest and we would be in a much better place. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Thank Absolutely. you for thank you for answering that. I was I wanted to ask that. I was so excited and then I spaced it. <laughs> it's all good. Um, anything else? I don't think so. Okay. Uh, Dr. Sala, thank you so much for sharing all this information with us. This was a, just a huge amount of stuff. And I mean, there's a lot of steps that we can all do to carry forward in our lives to help our planet. And we thank you for sharing that with us today. Thank you both so much for having me. Absolutely. Um, you want to close this out? Yeah. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for tuning in to another edition of the Complete Human Podcast with your host, Jana Breslin and Evan DeMarco. We were so fortunate enough to, uh, to have Dr. Sala on the podcast. We're going to put all of his information in the show notes. Um, author, leader of the Pristine Seas, uh, you know, recovering academic, I believe is what he <laughs> said. Um, and, you know, I, I think just a, a, a true humanitarian who's focused on all the things that we here at Complete Human have been talking about for so long. And that's making sure that we have a place to call home, not just next week or next year, but, mm -hmm. uh, you know, for generations to come. So highly recommend that you check out all of his information, his book, um, everything that he's doing. Well, again, we'll put that in the show notes, but uh, this has just been another clear reminder that uh, the opportunity to impact real change doesn't exist with governments. It doesn't exist with, you know, anybody but ourselves. And so if we can take that lesson out of this and apply real change to what it is that we do as, as people day in and day out, then we've mm -hmm. got a real shot of, of making a difference. Absolutely. Dr. Sala, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was a real pleasure. <laughs>